Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And yes, today is our very first Vice Presidential Series installment, taking a look at the third Vice President of the United States, this man right here, Aaron Burr. Yes, this is not a green screen. I am actually here live at the Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey, and this is really the gravesite of Aaron Burr. So, I'm excited. We're finally at the Vice Presidential Series. Have a lot of really, really cool, awesome things to tell you about Aaron Burr. But first, before we get into our third Vice President, Aaron Burr, what I need you to do is hit subscribe down below, leave us a like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. And of course, leave those comments and questions. We love those. We love answering the comments and questions from all our subscribers. So make sure you do it. Now, here we go, finally. The Vice Presidential Series begins with our third Vice President, Aaron Burr, and this is Dead History. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and yup, I'm here at the gravesite of our third Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. And I got some really, really fun, cool things to tell you about Aaron Burr, such as, as we all know, or most of us know, he was a part of the most famous duel in the history of our country. Yeah, when he dueled with Alexander Hamilton, and Aaron Burr actually fatally wounded and ended up killing Alexander Hamilton in that duel. And that took place right here in New Jersey. I'm going to tell you all about that. And of course, Aaron Burr was the third vice president of the United States under Thomas Jefferson. He was Thomas Jefferson's very first vice president under Jefferson during his first term. And then, of course, all the really other cool things about Aaron Burr, such as he's a New Jersey native. Not only is he buried here, not only did the duel happen here in New Jersey, but he was actually born in Newark, New Jersey. We're going to get into all those fascinating facts. So you did the likes, you did the subscribes, Hopefully you're leaving those comments and questions. And of course, if Henry was standing here with me, he would let you know. Go get the popcorn. Go get the potato chips. Get the soda. Whatever you want to snack on. Because finally it has arrived. The very first Vice Presidential Series installment taking a look at the third Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. TJ here with Dead History. And welcome to our very first Vice Presidential Series installment. Uh, it's definitely been a, uh, a long journey. Uh, I really can't believe it, to be co completely honest with everyone. Uh, we, you know, I started this channel, uh, I believe it was toward maybe the very tail end of October of 2020. Uh, I believe our first introductory video maybe went up early November of 2020. So not even a year has gone by. Here we are uh, early on in September of 2021. So not even a full year. And, uh, you know, we're already up to close to 7,000 subscribers on this page and on this channel. And, uh, and we've already gone through our entire presidential series and now we're here at our vice presidential series. So it's been a great journey. Uh, I just wanted to say a very sincere thank you to everyone for all the support, uh, the, the, you know, the wonderful comments, the compliments, uh, you know, even the constructive criticism, honestly. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate all of it. Uh, you know, the only way to get better is to continually do something and keep practicing to get better at it. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, it's good to have feedback uh, from people to know what you guys are enjoying. Uh, you know, because this this channel is for entertainment and for fun. Uh, there is definitely some educational value to it, for sure. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I want to make sure that I am entertaining you and you continue to watch. So, uh, so thank you so much for everything over these last 10 months or so. Um couple just quick housekeeping uh, notes just to uh, touch on before we get into this. Uh, the Vice Presidential Series is going to work 
pretty much the same way the presidential series worked. Um, we will be releasing a new video every single week. Uh, we will just be going in chronological order of the vice presidents. Uh, we will be taking a look at an overview of their life. Uh, you know, kind of their legacy, what they did, accomplishments, uh, good things, bad things, ugly things. And then, of course, taking a look at their grave sites because I have visited all of the vice presidential grave sites. So we're going to be doing all of that. Uh, now, it will be different in the respect of uh, I'm pretty sure it's just going to be one video for every vice president. You have to remember there is no uh, The Vice President is Dead <laughs> uh, book by Louis Pacone. Uh, hint, hint, Mr. Pacone, if you uh, do watch these videos, uh, maybe that's something to put in the works. <laughs> that would be truly incredible. Um, but the point is there's no book for me to read from uh, regarding the death. Uh, you know, there, there's not going to be any... You know, especially even with these early on pre uh, vice presidents that where there's only portraits made of them of obviously no photographs uh, before the photograph uh, was invented. Uh, you know, there's not even going to be usually I had probably over 100 photos and things to show you on the screen during these videos when we were talking about presidents. Uh, you know, depending on what the topic was at the time, I would show different things on the screen. Um you might have the same portrait of a vice president on the screen as I'm talking for 10 or 15 minutes about that person because there's just not as much out there on these vice presidents, including portraits and photos, uh, than there is the, the presidents, of course. So now this uh, first installment, it may be about an hour or so long. Uh, Aaron Burr uh, is kind of a polarizing, interesting person. Um, so this video may end up being an hour or even an hour and 15 minutes long. And, you know, let me know your feedback. If these videos are going to be about 45 minutes to an hour long each, do you want me to break them down into two videos? You know, a part one and a part two on Thursday and Friday? Or just keep it at, you know, one longer video uh, each week? Um, you know, because there's going to be some that there's more information on and some that there's less information on. So... You know, keep that in mind. I am going to try to bring you guys as much fun and interesting stuff as I can. Uh, what I mean by that is in regards to sites and locations of birthplaces and homes they lived in and places they may have died at and obviously the grave sites. I'm going to try to give you all of that as much as I possibly can regarding these vice presidents. Uh, just again, keep in mind... There's not nearly as much out there as there is with the president. So hopefully you really enjoy this. I'm going to be taking the majority of my, um, you know, information from, uh, it's actually uh, the Senate.gov website. The Senate.gov website is excellent. What an excellent resource when it comes to vice presidents. So I'll be reading a lot from that. Uh, of course, Wikipedia, I use that uh, often. And then any other, uh, you know, websites or, uh, you know, publications that I can find. Um, but, you know, and I will obviously cite those and note those uh, when they come up. Um, but again, there's just not, there's just not much. <laughs> there's really not much. So here we go, though. Let's jump right in. Let's do some, have some fun with this. Uh, we are talking about... Uh, the very first one. Oh, one last thing I need to touch on. A lot of you are probably automatically going to start to write me and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aaron Burr's not the first vice president. That's John Adams. Well, yes, we know that. John Adams was the first vice president uh, under George Washington. The second vice president under John Adams was Thomas Jefferson. And then the third vice president under Thomas Jefferson in his first term was Aaron Burr. Uh, we are not doing any repeats, meaning if the vice president later became president, we've already done a video on them in the presidential series. We are not going to be doubling up. So I'm not going to do another John Adams video or another Thomas Jefferson video or, you know, another Richard Nixon video. You know, he was a vice president who became president. I'm not going to do that. 
Um, I'm only going to be doing the vice presidents that we have not done. So these men never became president of the United States, obviously. So just that's why Aaron Burr's number one. So uh, Aaron Burr is the third vice president under Thomas Jefferson uh, in his first term. And uh, yeah, let's get right into this. Let's have some fun and jump right in. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Vice Presidential Series. And here we go, the third Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. Congressional Republicans were in a festive mood on January 24th of 1804 as they gathered at Stell's Hotel on Capitol Hill for a banquet celebrating the transfer of the Louisiana Territory to the United States. The festivities began at noon with the discharge of three pieces of cannon. President Thomas Jefferson and Vice President Aaron Burr were among the honored guests. They departed after the banquet, but the revelry but the revelry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but the revelry continued until nightfall. A number of the guests drank so many toasts that in the night they returned to their houses without their hats, one contemporary reported. But one, but when one celebrant offered a toast to Vice President Burr, the effect was pronounced and chilling. Few cheered him, the chronicler observed, and many declined drinking it. None of Aaron Burr's contemporaries knew quite what to make of this complex and fascinating individual. As Senator Robert C. Byrd observed in his November 13, 1987 address on the life and career of this controversial vice president, there is much that we will never know about the man. Much of Burr's early correspondence, entrusted to his daughter for safekeeping, was lost in 1812 when the ship carrying Theodosia Burr, that was uh, Theod uh, Theodosia Burr Alston, from South Carolina to New York for a long-awaited reunion with her father, disappeared off the North Carolina coast. Uh, Theodosia, Theodosia, I'm sorry, she was uh, Aaron Burr's first wife, and we will get into that. Burr was one of the most maligned and mistrusted public figures of his era, and without question the most controversial vice president of the early republic. But he never attempted to justify or explain his actions to his friends or to his enemies. One editor of Burr's papers has lamented, almost alone among the men who held high office in the early decades of this nation, Burr left behind no lengthy reclamations <clears throat> against his enemies. No explanations and justifications for his actions. He seems to have cared very little what his contemporaries thought of him or how historians would judge him. Few figures in American history have been as vilified or as romanticized by modern writers, urbane and charming, generous beyond prudence, proud, shrewd, and ambitious. He stood apart from other public figures of his day, an anomaly in an era when public office was a duty to be gravely and solemnly accepted but never pursued with unseemly enthusiasm. Burr enjoyed the game of politics. His zest for politics enabled him to endure the setbacks and defeats he experienced throughout his checkered career, but... As Mary Jo Klein, the editor of Burr's Papers, suggests, it also gave him the spectacular ability to inspire suspicion and even fear among the more conventional founding fathers. Aaron Burr was born at Newark, New Jersey on February 6th of 1756. His father, Aaron Burr Sr., was a highly respected clerical scholar who served as pastor of the Newark First Presbyterian Church and as president of the College of New Jersey 
which is now Princeton University. His mother, Esther Edwards Burr, was the daughter of the noted Puritan theologian and scholar Jonathan Edwards, who is most often remembered for his passionate and fiery sermons. The family moved to Princeton when the college relocated there soon after the future vice president's birth. But Burr did not remain there long. His father contracted a fever and died when young Aaron was only a year and a half old. His mother and her parents died soon thereafter. An orphan by the age of two, Burr and his older sister Sally moved to Philadelphia where they lived with family friends until 1759 when their uncle, Timothy Edwards of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, became their legal guardian. Edwards and his young words moved to Elizabethtown, New Jersey. The following year, Uncle Timothy soon discovered that Esther's little, dirty, noisy boy had inherited much of the Edwards family's renowned intellect, but little of their piety. High-spirited, independent, precocious, and self-confident, young Aaron at first studied with a private tutor. In 1769, he began his studies at the College of New Jersey, graduating in 1772. In 1773, he enrolled in the Reverend Joseph Bellamy's school at Bethlehem, Connecticut, to prepare for the ministry, but soon realized that he could neither wholly accept the Calvinist discipline of his forebears, nor forego the distractions of the town. He had, his authorized biographer relates, come to the conclusion that the road to heaven was open to all alike. In May of 1774, he moved to Litchfield, Connecticut, to study law under his brother-in-law, Tapping Reeve. But the outbreak of the American Revolution interrupted his studies. Aaron Burr joined the March on Quebec as an uncompensated gentleman volunteer in the summer of 1775. His bravery under fire during the ill-fated assault on that heavily fortified city on December 31st of 1775 won him a coveted appointment as an aide to the American Commander-in-Chief, General George Washington. But he was almost immediately reassigned to General Israel Putnam, Burr served as Putnam's aide until 1777, when he finally received a commission as a lieutenant colonel and command of his own regiment. Washington seems to have taken an immediate dislike to his ambitious young aide, and Burr appears to have reciprocated this sentiment. When Washington ordered the court-martial of General Charles Lee for dilatory conduct at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, New Jersey, in June of 1778, Aaron Burr sided with Lee. His own regiment had suffered heavy losses during the engagement after Washington ordered Burr to hold an exposed position in the blazing 96-degree heat. But notwithstanding his dislike for Colonel Burr, Washington respected his abilities, assigning him the difficult but crucial task of determining the future movements of the British forces in New York. Burr later commanded the troops stationed at Westchester, New York, imposing a rigid but effective discipline that brought order to the frontier outpost where unruly soldiers and footloose martyrs had formerly terrorized the nearby settlers. Burr resigned his commission in early 1779, his health broken by the accumulated stresses of several exhausting campaigns. He always took pride in his military record, and for the remainder of his, of his long life, admir admirers referred to him as Colonel Burr. Of his many accomplishments, only two are memorialized on the stone that marks his grave. Colonel in the, American, in the Army of the Revolution and Vice President of the United States. Aaron Burr lived an unsettled existence after leaving the Army traveling about the countryside, visiting friends and family, and studying law as his health permitted. In 1782, he began his legal practice, and he married Theodosia Bartow Prevost, the widow of a British Army officer. 
In November of 1783, the Burr family, which included his wife's two sons by her first husband and an infant daughter named Theodosa for her mother, they moved to New York after British forces evacuated the city. Burr lavished special attention on his only child, carefully supervising her education and cultivating her intellect. Young Theo, in turn, idolized her father, and she became his closest confidant after her mother died in 1794. Burr was an able lawyer. A New York law-bearing non-Whigs from the legal profession worked to his advantage as he rose to prominence in that calling. At this stage in his career, he was not, apparently, an adherent of any particular political persuasion. Despite his... <clears throat> Despite in responding to the call for volunteers at the outbreak of the revolution, he seems to have been curiously detached from the political ferment that brought it about. Once Burr began his political career, he served a single term in the New York Assembly during the 1784-1785 session, not returning to public life until 1788. Then, as the editors of his paper suggest, he appears to have played a minor and equivocal role in the New York debate over ratification of the proposed federal constitution. The Radical Sons of Liberty touted Burr as a possible delegate to the ratification convention. But for reasons he never elaborated, he declined to serve. Before long, however, he abandoned whatever reservations he may have had with respect to the new Constitution. After adoption by ten states, he advised one correspondent, I think it became both politic and necessary to adopt it. Burr was soon actively involved in New York politics. Joining forces with his future rival, Alexander Hamilton, he supported Richard Yates, a moderate anti-federalist and a long-standing friend who had helped him win admission to the bar in the 1789 gubernatorial election. Yates lost to George Clinton, a more ardent anti-federalist who had served as governor of New York since 1777. Governor Clinton, either willing to forgive Burr or shrewd enough to realize that the brilliant new young newcomer would soon emerge as a key player in New York politics, appointed him attorney general in 1789. In 1791, Clinton helped orchestrate Burr's election to the U.S. Senate. Burr unseated Senator Philip Sculler and made a lifelong enemy of Sculler's son-in-law, Alexander Ham Hamilton. Senator Burr had acquired a taste for politics, a profession that he would later advise an inspiring candidate he found a great deal of fun. In 1792, he entered the New York gubernatorial race, but soon withdrew in Clinton's favor. Northern Republicans mentioned him as a prospective vice presidential candidate in 1792. But Burr deferred to Clinton again after Southern Republicans refused to support the ambitious young senator. Better to select a person of more advanced life and longer standing in public trust, James Monroe, Monroe of Virginia cautioned, particularly one who, in consequence of such service, had given unequivocal proofs of what his principles really were. Burr was a vehement partisan in the Senate, siding with the anti-administration forces who opposed Hamilton's financial system and Washington's foreign policy. He mounted a spirited, though unsuccessful, defense of Pennsylvania Senator Albert Gallatin, the Swiss-born Republican who was unseated in 1794 after the Federalist majority determined that he did not meet the Constitution's nine-year citizenship requirement for senators. He voted against Washington's nomination of John Jay as an envoy to Great Britain in 1794 on the grounds that it would be mischievous and impolitic. 
to appoint Jay, who is the Chief Justice of the United States, to any other office or employment emanating from and holden at the pleasure of the executive. Burr was also one of the most outspoken opponents of the unpopular Jay Treaty, which the Federalist-dominated Senate approved in 1795. In 1796, the determined senator again set his sights on the vice presidency, and in a striking departure from 18th century electoral etiquette, he began began an energetic campaign to secure the support of his fellow Republicans. On June 26th of 1796, the Republican caucus endorsed him as their vice presidential candidate, although, as Burr's biographers have noted, for their party's vice presidential nomination, the Republicans were less unified than in their determination that Thomas Jefferson was the man to head their party's drive to oust the aristocrats. Republicans concentrated on capturing the presidency, but succeeded only in electing Thomas Jefferson vice president. Over half of the electors who voted for Jefferson failed to cast their second votes for Burr, who finished a disappointing fourth with only 30 electoral votes. Aaron Burr retired from the Senate in 1797. The following year, he returned to the New York Assembly, making several enemies during his brief and troubled term. He advocated defensive measures to protect New York Harbor as relations with France worsened in the wake of the XYZ affair, a prudent stance given in New York's strategic importance and vulnerable location, but one that prompted accusations from more doctrinaire Republicans that Burr had joined the Federalist camp. He became vulnerable to charges that he had abused the public trust for his personal benefit when he participated in a private land speculation venture in western New York and then sought to enact legislation removing restrictions on land ownership by non-citizens, a measure that would increase the value of his western lands. Working in concert with Hamilton, Burr helped secure a charter and raise subscriptions for a private company to improve the water supply of pestilence-ridden Manhattan. But New Yorkers were shocked to learn that the surplus capital from the venture had been used to establish the Bank of Manhattan. Although Federalists were heavily involved in the enterprise, the bank was controlled by Republicans. New York voters, suspicious as they were of banks, deserted the party in droves in the 1799 state election, and Burr was turned out of office. One observer commented in disgust that the Republicans had such a damned ticket that no decent man could hold up his head to support it. Although some Republicans were increasingly uncomfortable with Burr's questionable financial dealings and his willingness to cooperate with Federalists to achieve his ends, he remained a valuable asset. He had one Federalist admitted by his arts and intrigues, done a great deal towards revolutionizing the state, building a political base that would help him launch his national career. Burr's vehement opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts in the New York Assembly had won Republicans the support of New York's large and rapidly growing immigrant community. In a feat one admirer attributed to the intervention of a supreme power and our friend Burr, the agent. He ensured that New York City elected a Republican delegation to the state legislature in 1800, laying the groundwork for a Republican victory in the presidential contest later that year. New York was one of the states in which the legislature selected presidential electors and its 12 electors compromised over 15% of the 70 votes necessary to achieve an electoral majority. Republican control of the New York legislature was crucial, and New York City's 13-member delegation gave the party a majority. In 1800, Republican strategists hoped to cement their fledgling coalition by seeking 
for geographical balance a New Yorker as their vice presidential candidate. One obvious choice was New York's elder statesman, George Clinton, but his reluctance to enter the race cleared the way for Burr's unanimous nomination by the Republican caucus on May 11th of 1800. Although Jefferson would later claim, after Burr discredited himself by his behavior during the election and in office, that he had harbored reservations about his New York lieutenant from the time of their first meeting in 1791 or 1792, contemporary correspondence suggests that their relationship was cordial during the 1790s. If Jefferson had reservations about Burr in 1800, he laid them aside to secure a Republican victory, using his influence to ensure that all of Virginia's 21 electors would cast their second votes for his running mate. Jefferson waged a behind-the-scenes campaign, writing letters to his political lieutenants and encouraging the preparation and dissemination of pamphlets and press accounts critical of John Adams' administration, which had supported the Alien and Sedition Acts and increased the military establishment. Burr was an active campaigner, visiting Rhode Island and Connecticut in late August to shore up Republican support. The matter of VP is of very, very little comparative consequence, he informed one correspondent as he speculated that the election might result in the election of Jefferson as president and Adams as vice president. And any sacrifice on that head ought to be made to obtain a single vo vote for Jefferson. Surprising as it may might appear to modern observers, Burr's clearly successful political prowess in the 1800 election only raised suspicion among his rivals and allies that he was not to be trusted. He did not fit the mold of the dispassionate statesmen who remained aloof from the fray of politics while their supporters worked to secure their election. But the creation of nationwide popularity-based political parties, one Burr scholar ex explains, demanded men who were willing to bargain regional alliances, men able to climb the ladder of popular support and to convey their own enjoyment of the fun of politics. In this respect, she suggests, Burr was the ghost of politics yet to come. Jefferson soon had ample reason to distrust Burr. In 1800, as in the three previous presidential elections, each elector cast two votes without distinguishing between presidential and vice presidential candidates. Republican strategists expected that all of their electors would cast one vote for Jefferson and that most enough to guarantee that Burr would receive the second highest number of votes, but not enough to jeopardize Jefferson's margin, would cast their second votes for Burr. Jefferson and his lieutenants left the implementation of this scheme to chance, never asking even a single elector to withhold a vote from Burr. Although Jefferson's friend and advisor, James Madison, would later allege that Republicans had been lulled by false assurances dispatched at the critical moment to the electors of one state that the votes of another would be different from what they proved to be. Increasingly confident of victory as the news of the election filtered in from the states, Republicans were stunned to learn by mid-December that, although they had clearly defeated Adams and his running mate, Charles Coatsworth Pickney of South Carolina, they had failed to elect a president. Jefferson and Burr, whether by neglect or miscalculation, would each receive 73 electoral votes. The election would be decided by the House of Representatives, as provided in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, which directed that, if there be more than one candidate who have such a majority and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president, with each state having one vote. The representatives from each state would poll their delegation to determine how their state would cast its single vote, with deadlocked states abstaining. 
As soon as the outcome of the election became apparent, but before Congress met to count the electoral votes on February 11th of 1801, the Federalists began a last-ditch effort to defeat Jefferson. Some, while resigned to a Republican victory, believed that the less partisan and more flexible Burr was by far the lesser of two evils. Others supported Burr in the hope that, if a deadlock could be prolonged indefinitely, the Federalist-dominated Congress could resolve the impasse with legislation authorizing the Senate to elect a Federalist president. A hope that had no constitutional basis, but demonstrated that uncertain temper of the times. Alexander Hamilton, a prominent New York Federalist, actively opposed Burr, repeatedly attempting to convince his colleagues that Burr was a man whose public principles have no other spring or aim than his own aggrandizement. Interesting. Burr and Hamilton already. <laughs> Butting heads. Burr never explained his role in the drama that subsequently unfolded in the House of Representatives, which cast 36 ballots before finally declaring Jefferson the winner on February 17th of 1801. The few comments he ventured at the time were guarded, evasive, and contradictory, professing indignation at rumors that he was soliciting Federalist support in an attempt to wrest the presidency from Jefferson, Burr initially denied that I could submit to be an instrument in counteracting the wishes and expectations of the United States, instructing his friend Samuel Smith to declare these sentiments if the occasion shall require. One prominent Federalist, Robert Goodloe, Harper of South Carolina, advised Burr against withdrawing from the presidential contest, urging that he take no step whatsoever, but by which the choice of the House of Representatives can be impeded or embarrassed, and instead keep the game perfectly in your own hand. Burr appears to have followed Harper's advice to the letter during the tense and confused days that followed. He never actively solicited Federalist votes, but seemed willing enough to accept them. In late December, he informed Samuel Smith that if the House elected him president, he would not step aside for Jefferson. Rumors of Burr's change of heart soon appeared in the press. Tempers flared and reports of impending armed conflict spread, but Burr remained silent. When the House cast the first ballot on February 11th, 8 of 16 states, one less than the simple majority required to elect the president, voted for Jefferson. Six states voted for Burr, with two states divided and not voting. This ratio remained, con remained constant through 34 subsequent ballots taken over the course of a week. The deadlock was not resolved until February 17th when Jefferson received, received the votes of 10 states on the 36th ballot. Representative James A. Bayard, of a Federalist from Delaware, and Burr himself finally resolved the impasse. As Delaware's only representative, Bayard controlled his state's vote. He voted for Burr on the first several ballots, but was under considerable, uh, considerable pressure from Hamilton to change his vote and resolve the contest in Jefferson's favor. In thus throwing his support to Jefferson, Hamilton rose above partisan interests and helped to save the nation, concluding that Burr could not muster enough Republican support to win the election and having received assurances with, with respect to Jefferson's fiscal and appointments policies. Bayard finally informed his fellow Federalists that he could not exclude Jefferson at the expense of the Constitution. Correspondence from Burr, who was awaiting the outcome of the election in New York, had arrived on February 15th. These letters that are now lost revealed that he had abandoned any hope of winning the presidency. His supporters finally agreed that when the state delegations were polled before the House cast its 36th ballot on February 17th, Vermont and Maryland Federalists would withhold their votes. 
a move that freed their previously deadlocked delegations to vote for Jefferson. Bayard and the South Carolina representatives would cast blank ballots, further eroding Burr's margin. Jefferson, with 10 votes, would become president, while Burr, with four, would become vice president. The election and the confusion that followed exposed a critical flaw in the constitutional provision governing, governing the election of the president and the vice president. The 12th Amendment, which passed both houses during the fall of 1803 and was ratified by the requisite number of states in time for the 1804 election, changed the me method of election by requiring electors to de designate one vote for a presidential candidate and the other for a vice presidential candidate. Intended to prevent an unscrupulous vice presidential candidate or his supporters from subverting the electoral process, the amendment was a Republican initiative sponsored in the House of Representatives by John Dawson and in the Senate by Burr's rival, DeWitt Clinton. If Burr was at all chagrined by the outcome of the election or by the taint that he had acquired from not empathetically renouncing his widely rumored presidential aspirations, he gave no sign of it. I join my hearty congratulations on the auspicious events of the 17th, he wrote to Albert Gallatin while en route to Washington for the March 4th inauguration. As to the infamous slanders which have been so industriously circulated, they are now of little consequence, and those who believe them will doubtless blush at their own weakness. Burr arrived in Washington three days before the inauguration and found accommodations in nearby Georgetown. On March 4th of 1801, Senate President Pro Tempor James Hillhouse administered the oath of office to Burr in the Senate chamber on the ground floor of the new Capitol in Washington. The new vice president offered a brief address of about three sentences, which the press ignored in favor of Jefferson's elegant and wonderful conciliatory inaugural address. Burr assumed the president's chair and administered the oath of office to the newly elected senators who presented their credentials. When Jefferson and the presidential party arrived in the Senate chamber, Burr left the Senate presidency and joined Chief Justice John Marshall to listen to Jefferson's inaugural address. He later described the day as serene and temperate. The concourse of people immense all passed off handsomely. Great joy, but no riot. The new vice president soon received a flood of letters from friends, political allies, and relatives seeking appointments in the new administration or demanding the removal of Adams' Federalist appointees. Burr, who could never refuse a friend and considered patronage a means of cementing alliances and paying political debts, passed a number of these requests along to Jefferson. The president, however, became increasingly uncomfortable with each new recommendation. Most damning, as historian Mary Jo Klein has explained, were the repeated requests for consideration of the claims of the faithful from other states and territories. Jefferson was perfectly willing to replace Adams' midnight appointments with marshals and court officers who were loyal Republicans as well as to remove Federalists who displayed malvers malversation or inherent disqualification for office, appointing Republicans to the vacant posts. Still mindful of the cha charges of nepotism he had le leveled against the uh, Adams administration, he hesitated to dismiss civil, civil, uh, civil servants solely for political reasons. Nor did he think it appropriate for the ambitious New Yorker to concern himself with appointments to federal offices in other states. The final insult appears to have occurred in the fall of 1801, with Burr's campaign to secure an appointment for his ally, Matthew L. Davis, to a naval post in New York. The president, already suspicious of the enterprising vice president who had jeopardized his election, 
soon began to distance himself from Burr. Thereafter, in making federal appointments in New York, he relied on George Clinton or Clinton's nephew, DeWitt Clinton. After the Clintons replaced Burr as the administration liaison to the New York Republican Party, DeWitt spared no effort to discredit the vice president in his home state. Assisted by New York American citizen editor James Cheatham, he would wage a savage war against the vice president in the local press. The handbills were numerous of various descriptions, uniform, however, in indecent in abuse, Burr reported. To vilify Aaron Burr was deemed of so much consequence that packages of them were sent to various parts of the country. It was becoming painfully apparent, one of his allies observed, that the vice president's influence and weight with the administration is, in my opinion, not such as I could wish. Bereft of the political base that had made him a formidable force in New York politics and an attractive vice presidential prospect, he was now a liability to the administration. During Aaron Burr's single term in office, whatever influence or status he enjoyed would derive solely from his position as president of the Senate. Aaron Burr, interesting guy, that's for sure. A polarizing guy, even for his time. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Burr was one of the most skilled uh, parliamentarians, 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 I'm sorry, to serve as president of the Senate. A striking contrast to Adams and a worthy successor to Jefferson. Mr. Burr, Burr, the vice president, presides in the Senate with great ease, dignity, and propriety. Senator William Plummer observed. He was a Federalist from New Hampshire. He preserves good order, silence, and decorum in debate. He confines the speaker to the point. He has excluded all spectators from the area of the Senate chamber, except the members from the other house, a measure which contributes much to good order. Although Burr was universally respected, for his parliamentary skills and his impartial rulings, Senate Republicans noted with mounting concern his easy familiarity with his many Federalist friends. Alienated from his own party, pragmatic at the expense of principle, and beset by the chronic financial difficulties that dogged him throughout his career, Burr was increasingly regarded by his fellow Republicans as an unprincipled opportunist who would stop at nothing to rebuild his shattered political and personal fortunes. They found ample evidence of the vice president's apostasy on January 27th of 1802 when Burr cast a tie-breaking vote that undercut the Republican effort to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. That act, signed into law less than a week before Jefferson's election, enacted badly needed reforms, providing a circuit court judges to relieve the Supreme Court justices from the (coughs) burdensome and exhausting chore of riding, circuit, and reducing the number of justices from six to five, effective with the next vacancy. The act became effective in time to allow John Adams to appoint Federalist judges to the new circuit courts, a development that had heightened Republican fears of a Federalist-controlled judiciary. And with one less Supreme Court justice, it appeared unlikely that Jefferson would ever have opportunity to appoint a Republican nominee to the Supreme Court. On January 6th of 1802, Senator John Breckinridge introduced a bill to repeal the Judiciary Act. Burr's vote would prove crucial in the Senate, where the absence of one Republican and the resignation of another had eroded the administration's already slim margin. Republicans were greatly relieved when the Senate deadlocked on a vote to proceed to a third reading of the repeal bill on January 26th and Aaron Burr resolved the tie in favor of the repealers. 
But he had secretly informed Federalists that he would support their attempts to block repeal by adding amendments that would make the Judiciary Act acceptable to moderate Republicans. Thus, the next day, when his friend Jonathan Dayton moved to refer the bill to a select committee with instructions to consider and report the alterations which may be proper in the judiciary system of the United States, Burr resolved the tie in favor of the Federalists. Burr explained that he had voted for referral in hopes of reaching a compromise. I am for the, uh, the affirmative because I can never resist the reference of a measure where the Senate is so nicely balanced. When the object is to effect amendment that may accommodate it to the opinions of a larger majority, and particularly when I can believe that gentlemen are sincere in wishing a reference for this purpose. Should it, however, at any time appear that delay only is intended, my conduct will be different. Republicans who resented Burr's treachery were outraged when he announced the members of the select committee. During the early 1800s, senators voted to choose members of these temporary committees, which normally consisted of three members. But on this occasion, two senators tied for first place and three for second place. The committee would therefore, Burr announced, compromise five members, two Republicans who favored repeal, two Federalists who had voted against repeal, and subsequently voted to refer the bill to committee in hopes of effecting a compromise and one Republican moderate, John Ewing Calhoun, Calhoun, who had sided with the Federalists. An account of the proceedings in the New York Evening Post reveals that Burr answered Republican challenges to this unexpected development with his customary ease and composure. The Democratic Republican members appeared extremely discontented at the apparent result and before the vote was finally declared by the vice president, General James Jackson rose and proposed that the Senate should ballot against for the committee. A ballot, ballot again for the committee. This dashing proposition did not material, materialize, interrupt the regularity of the scrutiny. The vice president was very deliberate. He took the ballots of the respective senators examined them attentively, stated the number of them, and holding them up in his hand, he had mentioned that gentlemen, if they choose, might come and examine them. Mr. Governor, Governor Morris of New York hoped never to see in the Senate a proceeding implying so much distrust. After a pause, the vice president declared his opinion that the ballots were truly counted. Of course, the committee was composed, as stated above, to the no small chagrin of some of the Democratic members of Congress in both houses. Although Burr had substantive objections to the repeal bill and told one correspondent that he was troubled at the prospect of depriving the 26 judge the of depriving the 26 judges of office and pay, his growing estrangement from the administration was also a factor. He may, as one scholar of the er, uh, early judiciary suggests, have hoped to advance his stature not only with moderates of his own party, but also with Federalists, and perhaps, e perhaps even paved the way for the eventual formation of a third party under his leadership. But the immediate result of Burr's abortive attempt to reach a compromise was his further isolation from his party. He had as Jefferson biographer has noted, offended one side without satisfying the other. Among the advisors who formed Jefferson's inner circle, only Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin continued to support the increasingly troublesome vice president. Aaron Burr soon abandoned any hope of winning renomination to a second term. In early, of, early 1804, he called on Thomas Jefferson to inform him that he recognized it would be for the interest of the Republic, Republican cause for him to retire, that a disadvantageous schism would otherwise take place. But he was concerned that were he to retire, it would be said that he shrunk from the public sentence. 
He would need, Burr suggested, some mark of favor, which would declare to the world that he retired with Jefferson's confidence. Jefferson replied that he had not attempted to influence the 1800 election on his own or Burr's behalf, nor would he do so in the next election. A cool rejoinder that masked his now considerable resentment of the man whom he claimed he had habitually cautioned Mr. Madison against trusting too much. The Republicans ultimately settled on George Clinton as their new vice presidential candidate, and Aaron Burr retired from national politics without Jefferson's mark of favor, entering the 1804 New York gubernatorial race in a desperate attempt to restore his rapidly failing career. That now brings us to the famous, infamous, if you will, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr duel. And that was the Vienna Wood Dance in D, one of my all-time favorites. And now let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Hello? Hello, for $10,000, who shot... Excuse me? I'm afraid your time is almost up. I'm sorry, maybe next time. Got milk. Aaron Burr no longer commanded the respect and support from New York Republicans that he had once enjoyed. He entered the gubernatorial race as an independent and actively sought Federalist support when it became apparent that the Federalists would not offer a candidate of their own. But Alexander Hamilton was soon intriguing for any candidate who can have a chance of success against Aaron Burr. Burr plunged enthusiastically into the campaign, delivering speeches and distributing campaign literature, but he could not overcome the liabilities he had acquired since 1800. He lost the election by an overwhelming 8,000 vote margin. Aaron Burr's defeat left him bitter and disillusioned. He blamed Alexander Hamilton for his predicament. And when he learned that his rival and former ally had referred to him at a private dinner party as a dangerous man and who ought not to be trusted, he demanded an explanation. The conflict escalated. And as Burr and Hamilton exchanged a series of letters and finally came to a head on June 27th of 1804, when Aaron Burr challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel. The grim engagement, which took place on July 11th at Weehawken, New Jersey, resulted in Alexander Hamilton's death the following day. Alexander, Bur I'm sorry, Aaron Burr's opponents called for his arrest, but the outcry against him was by no means universal. Dueling was an expressly prohibited by law in most states. And murder was a crime in every state. But encounters on the field of honor still took place during the early 19th century, particularly in the southern states. Burr had previously challenged Hamilton's brother-in-law, John Church, to a duel, a bloodless encounter that enabled them to confront and then forget their differences. And Hamilton's son Philip had incurred a mortal wound on the dueling ground the previous year. Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and others of similar stature subscribed to the Code Duella. But few suffered the stigma that Burr carried after that fatal morning at Weehawken. He left New York a month after Alexander Hamilton's death to allow public opinion to take its proper course traveling south in hopes of a reunion with his daughter, Theodosa, Theodosia. Now the wife of Joseph Alston, a South Carolina planter with impeccable Republican credentials, and his young grandson, Aaron Burr Alston. 
He was eventually indicted in New York and New Jersey, but he never stood trial in either jurisdiction. Burr returned to the Senate in early November, in time for the second session of the 8th Congress. It was, as Senator Plumer noted, an awkward occasion. November 7th of 1804, this day the Senate made a quorum for the first time. This session, which began two days earlier, Mr. Burr, the vice president, appeared and took a seat in the Senate the very first day of the session. It has been unusual for the vice president to take this seat the first day of the session, but this man, though indicted in New York and New Jersey for the murder of the illustrious Hamilton, is determined to brave public opinion. What a humiliating circumstance that a man who for months has fled from justice and who by the legal authorities is now accused of murder should preside over the first branch of the national legislature. I have avoided him. His presence to me is odious. I have merely bowed and spoken to him. Federalists appear to despise, neglect, and abhor him. The Democrats, Republicans, at least many of them, appear attentive to him, and he is very familiar with them. What line of conduct they will generally observe to him is yet uncertain. Republicans had indeed become more attentive to Burr. Even Jefferson seemed anxious to mend fences with his errant vi vice president. Mr. Jefferson has shown more attention and invited Mr. Burr oftener to his house within this three weeks than he ever did in the course of the same time before, Plumer marveled. Mr. Gallatin, the Secretary of the Treasury, has waited upon him often at his Burr's lodging and on one day was closeted with him more than two hours. The Secretary of State, Mr. Madison, formerly the intimate friend of General Hamilton, had taken his murderer into his carriage, rode with him, accompanied him on a visit to M. Tara, the French minister. United States Attorney Alexander Dallas wrote to a New Jersey governor, Joseph Bloomfield, urging him to grant clemency to the vice president. Republicans in Congress particularly in the Senate, were equally solicitous of Burr. The proceedings in New York, in consequence of the duel, are deemed by a number of the senators to be harsh and unprecedented. Senator Sen Samuel L. Mitchell explained to his wife, they believe it very unfair and partial to make him the victim of justice, while several other persons who have killed their opponents in duels at Hoboken are suffered to go at large without molestation. Under these impressions, an address has been drawn up to Governor Bloomfield for the purpose of inducing him to quash or suspend the proceedings against the vice president. Federalists were stunned by the Republicans' newfound respect for Burr, which Plummer attributed to their joy for the death of Hamilton. But the real reason for Republicans' apparent change of heart, as Burr's biographers Herbert Parmet and Marie Hecht have suggested, was the impending impeachment trial of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase. Aaron Burr had earlier presided over the impeachment trial of New Hampshire Judge John Pickering, a reverend patriot and the author of his state's 1784 constitution, who by 1803 had become insane and an alcoholic. The House of Representatives impeached Pickering on March 2nd of 1803 for conduct contrary to his trust and duty as judge, and the trial in the Senate was held a year later. Even the judge's Federalist supporters were embarrassed by his ravings from the bench. But they saw in the charges against him the opening salvoy in the Republicans' assault on the federal judiciary. They would defend him at all costs, maintaining throughout his trial that insanity did not constitute grounds for removal. Republicans were forced to counter that the judge was perfectly sane, but guilty of misconduct that justified his removal from office, although Jefferson and some moderate Republicans were uneasy at the thought of subjecting a man so obviously tormented to the ordeal of an impeachment trial. The trial was a highly partisan proceeding, and on March 12th of 1804, the final vote 
that removed Pickering from office split along party lines. The vice president made very formal arrangements for the trial. Representative Manasa Cutler, a Federalist from Massachusetts, informed a correspondent, and the court was opened with a dignified solemnity. Burr presided over the preliminary proceedings and most of the trial with his customary tact and skill, deferring to the Senate to resolve the difficult procedural issues that arose after Pickering failed to appear and as his son's attorney, Robert Goodloe Harper, informed the court that the judge, being in a state of absolute and long-continued insanity, could neither appear nor authorize another to appear for him. But on March 10th, Aaron Burr, concerned about his gubernatorial campaign in New York, abruptly left the Senate, departing in the midst of a heated debate over Connecticut Federalist Uriah Tracy's motion to postpone the trial until the following session. Pres President Pro Tempor Jesse Franklin, a North Carolina Republican, presided for the remainder of the trial, and Burr's unexpected departure made no apparent difference in the outcome of the proceedings. Pickering's trial, as Jefferson's biographers have stressed, was a confused and tragic episode. The participants in this sorry spectacle all realized that Pickering was a deeply disturbed man and were greatly relieved when the trial ended with his removal from office. But the impending trial of Associate Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase impeached for judicial misconduct by the House of Representatives on March 12th of 1804, the day the Pickering's trial ended, was another matter. Appointed to the court by President Washington and confirmed by a narrow margin, Chase was an inveterate Federalist, known for his intemperate and partisan harangues from the bench and for his flagrant prejudice against defendants accused of violating the Sedition Act. For many Republicans, Chase personified all the evils inherent in the Federalist-controlled judiciary. As his impeachment trial approached, these Republicans were painfully aware that they could ill afford to offend the man whose rulings would govern the proceedings, and they thus treated Burr with studied deference. But it was an uneasy truce at best. Burr was noticeably uncomfortable in the Senate chamber. After the minutes of the proceedings uh, of the preceding day had been read, the little business before us dispatched, Plummer observed. The vice president would leave the chair, come to some one senator, and intimate in strong terms that it was best to adjourn, and sometimes request a senator to move an adjournment. And in a few minutes, he was gone. He seemed to have lost those easy, graceful manners that the hours away the last session. He is now uneasy, discontented, and hurried. Plumer also sensed an unusual concern and anxiety in the leading Democratic members of the Senate, who feared the talents of Burr. The vice president appeared friendly to them. He reflected, but some office must be given him. What office can that be that he will accept and not injure them? Burr imposed a right, rigid discipline on the conduct of the Chase impeachment trial, conducting the proceedings, as one reporter observed, with the dignity and impartiality of an angel, but with the rigor of a devil. Manasseh Cutler reported that the trial was conducted with a propriety and solemnity solemnity uh, throughout the, which reflects honor upon the Senate. It must be acknowledged that Burr has displayed much ability and since the first day I've seen nothing of partiality. Although the managers appointed by the House of Representatives and led by Republican Representative John Randolph of Virginia were responsible for trying the case, Burr would occasionally intervene, posing questions of his own to a witness when the irrational and ineffective Randolph, or another inter interrogator, failed to pursue a particular line of questioning or seeking clarification of an incomplete or ambiguous response. 
When either side objected to a question posed by the other, Burr took careful note of the objection, ordering that the offending question be reduced to writing and put to the Senate for determination. But at times, Burr's rigid insistence on absolute decorum only increased the tensions that simmered in the Senate chamber. Elaborately redecorated for the occasion under his careful supervision. Although Senate Plumer would conclude by the end of the trial that Burr had certainly, on the whole, done himself the Senate and the nation honor by the dignified manner in which he had, has presided over this high and numerous court. He was outraged at Burr's treatment of, of Chase on January 2nd of 1805 when the judge appeared before the Senate to enter his plea. Before the court opened, Plumer had overheard the vice president's caustic comment as he ordered Sergeant-at-Arms James Mathers to remove the chair set aside for the aged justice. Let the judge take care to find a seat for himself. Mathers replaced the chair after Chase moved that a seat be assigned him, and the vice president, in a very cold, formal, insolent manner, replied he presumed the court would not object to taking a seat. But Burr would not permit Mathers to provide a table for the judge's convenience. Burr repeatedly interrupted the aged and frail judge as Chase, at times breaking into tears, requested additional time to prepare his answer to the impeachment. Burr's peevishness, or peevishness continued as the proceedings unfolded. On one occasion, he notified one of Chase's attorneys, Philip Barton Key, that he must not appear as counsel in his loose coat, great coat or overcoat, a proviso that senators criticized and Key ignored. By the first week of February, the Senate's now remarkably testy president was in a rage because we do not sit longer. Unruly senators on both sides of the aisle bristled. <clears throat> Plumer observed when Burr lectured them on judicial etiquette after the High Court of Impeachment had adjourned for the day on February 12th. Just as the time for adjourning to tomorrow was to be put in the Secretary's office, Mr. Burr said he wished to inform the Senate of some in irregularities that he observed in the court. Some of the senators, as he said during the trial, and while a witness was under examination, walked between him and the managers. Others eat apples, and some eat cake in their seats. Mr. Timothy Pickering said he did eat an apple, but it was at a time when the president had retired from the chair. Burr replied he did not mean him. He did not see him. Mr. Robert Wright said he did eat cake. He had just a right so to do. He was faint, but he disturbed nobody. He never would submit to be schooled and cat <laughs> catechized by in this manner. Chastised, I'm sorry. Chastised. Uh, at this instance, a motion was made by Mr. Stephen Rowe Bradley, who also had eaten cake for an adjournment. Burr told Wright he was not in order. Sit down. The Senate adjourned. And I left Wright and Burr scolding. Although rightfully concerned about maintaining an atmosphere of judicial decorum, Burr had obviously lost much of the easy grace and consummate tact that had made him such an effective presiding officer. The ordeal ended on March 1st when Burr announced, after a separate vote on each article of impeachment, that there is not a constitutional majority of votes finding Samuel Chase Esquire guilty on any one article. Burr's final days in the Senate would have been unpleasant even without the strain of presiding over a taxing and bitterly contested impeachment trial. He presided over the February 13, 1805 joint session of Congress, counting the electoral returns. In that capacity, he announced that Jefferson had been re-elected and that his old rival, George Clinton, would succeed him as vice president. Senator Samuel Mitchell reported that Burr performed this painful duty with so much regularity and composure that you would not have seen the latest deviation from his common manner or heard the smallest departure from his usual tone. 
but Mitchell observed that always impeccably attired vice president appeared rather more carefully dressed than usual for the occasion. A week later, Republican Senator John Smith of New York introduced a bill freeing from postage all letters and packets to and from Aaron Burr, and Burr found himself in the unenviable un, 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 position of listening as senators questioned the propriety of granting him the franking privilege. Although surviving accounts of the debate do not indicate that the issue of Burr's character was ever raised in his presence, it was only certainly an unspoken consideration. The debate was particularly intense on February... Oh, I'm sorry. It was particularly intense on February 27th. Senator John Quincy Adams, a Massachusetts Federalist, proposed an amendment to extend the Frank to all former vice presidents, omitting the explicit reference to Burr. And Republican James Jackson of Georgia cautioned in response that we might hereafter have a vice president to whom it would be improper to grant the privilege. After Federalist Senators Timothy Pickering of Massachusetts and James Hillhouse of Connecticut finally advocated the indelicacy of the situation indelicacy of the situation of having Mr. Burr in the chair. The vice president volunteered that he was apprehensive that tomorrow he should be afflicted with pain in the head and should be unable to attend. With Burr absent from the chamber, his opponents were free to speak their minds. The debate was bitter and intense. Senator Hillhouse was resolutely opposed to giving Burr such a dangerous privilege. The vice president is an ambitious man, he warned his colleagues. He aspired to the presidency. Disappointed ambition will be restless. You put arms into his hands to attack your government. He may disseminate seditious pamphlets, newspapers, and letters at the expense of the very government he is destroying. Senator Pickering feared that Burr would sell the right of franking to commercial houses, and in the city of New York alone it might give him a fortune. But Burr's opponents' ca supporters countered. The reason why gentlemen opposed this bill is because Mr. Burr has fought a duel and killed a man. Although the bill passed by a vote of 18 to 13, with all but three of the New England senators voting against it, the House subsequently postponed the measure. Aaron Burr left the Senate the day after the Chase trial concluded and just two days before George Clinton took office as the nation's fourth vice president. Federalists and Republicans alike were deeply moved by his March 2, 1805 farewell address, still one of the most celebrated speeches in the history of the early republic. His remarks were intended for the senators alone, unexpectedly delivered at the conclusion of a closed-door executive session. Burr began his 20-minute address with an acknowledgement that he must at times have wounded the feelings of individual members. But he had avoided entering into explanation at the time, he explained, because a moment of irritation was not a moment for explanation, because his position, being in the chair, rendered it impossible to enter into explanations without obvious danger of consequences with which must injure the dignity of the Senate or prove disagreeable and injurious in more than one point of view. Only the ignorant and unthinking, he continued, affected to treat as unnecessary and fastidious a rigid attention to rules and decorum. But Burr thought nothing trivial which touched, however remotely, the dignity of the Senate and he cautioned senators to avoid the smallest relaxation of the habits which he had endeavored to in inculate, in insulate, <clears throat> and establish. Likening the Senate to a sanctuary, a citadel of law, of order, and, liber and of liberty. Burr predicted that if constitution be destined ever to perish by the sacrilegious hands of the demagogue or the or the usurper which God avert, 
its expiring agonies will be witnessed on this floor. I apologize to everyone. I was receiving a call actually from Henry. So Henry made a, a guest call in a appearance when I was recording this. And he told me to tell everyone in the audience that he says hello. So a big shout out from Henry. Uh, so as I was talking about uh, Burr's farewell address, likening the Senate to a sanctuary, a citadel of law, of order, and of liberty. Burr predicted that if the Constitution be destined ever to perish by the sacrilegious hands of the demagogue of the us usurper which God avert, its expiring agonies will be witnessed on this floor. Concluding his remarks with the customary expressions of respect and goodwill, Aaron Burr left the Senate chamber, closing the door behind him. Senator Mitchell noted, with some force, a solemn and silent weeping filled the Senate chamber for perhaps five minutes. Mitchell, for one, had never experienced anything of the kind so affecting. And New York Republican John Smith, stout and manly as he is, laid his head upon his table and did not recover from his emotion for a quarter of an hour or more. But DeW DeWitt Clinton's ally, New York American citizen editor James Cheatham, and others who suspected that Burr's melodio harmonic pathos, harmonico pathos was merely an effort to restore his political fortunes, doubted that the flowing tear could wash away the dingy stains of Burr's political degeneracy. The 49-year-old vice president, I'm sorry, the 49-year-old former vice president was heavily in debt at the time of his forced retirement from politics. He had been involved in a number of specul speculative ventures throughout his career, many of which had resulted in substantial losses. Generous beyond prudence, Aaron Burr could never refuse a relative or a friend in need. Even if it meant going further into debt, he assumed responsibility for a number of young wards throughout the years, some of them the children of clients, others rumored to have been his own offspring. And his generosity to his charges further strained his always precarious finances. Aaron Bird had always lived, dressed, and entertained well, even when he could ill afford to do so. Surveying his limited prospects, the optimistic and always enterprising former vice president now looked to the West. The full extent of Burr's business and other ventures in the West will probably never be known. But his first undertaking appears to have been in the Indiana Canal Company. Aaron Burr and his fellow investors intended to construct a canal to circumvent the Ohio River Rapids at Louisville. But as his biographers have explained... The resourceful vice president had more than one plan for the future, but several alternate ones depending on change in history. His most ambitious scheme was contingent upon the outbreak of a war with Spain, which was still in possession of West Florida and Mexico and increasingly hostile toward the burgeoning new nation that pressed along its eastern border. Aaron Burr planned an assault on Mexico and anticipated that the western states would leave the Union to join in a southeastern confederacy under his leadership. One of Aaron Burr's accomplices, Louisiana Governor James Wilkinson, betrayed the conspiracy before Burr could begin his expedition, and the former vice president was arrested on charges of treason. Chief Justice John Marshall presided over Burr's trial— which opened on August 3rd of 1807 in Richmond, Virginia. The jury, guarded by Marshall's written opinion that two witnesses must testify to a specific overact to establish treason, overt act to establish treason, a standard that the prosecution failed to meet, ultimately found that Aaron Burr is not proved to be guilty under this indictment. Pressed by debts and fearful of further prosecution, Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr departed for Europe under an assumed name in June of 1808. Aaron Burr spent the next four years in self-imposed exile. He traveled throughout England and the continent, sightseeing, reading, entertaining the ladies, 
who found him an attractive companion and seeking support for another southwestern expedition. His overtures to the British and French courts failed miserably. In the spring of 1812, convinced that a war between the United States and Great Britain was imminent, Aaron Burr returned home under the alias M. Arnott. He took a room near the Boston waterfront, a far cry from the handsome and well-furnished New York mansion, Richmond Hill, that he had maintained, maintained in better times. While testing the waters to determine whether he could safely return to New York, Aaron Burr reappeared in New York in June of 1812, ready to resume his legal career. He eagerly looked forward to a reunion with his beloved Theo and his grandson, Aaron Burr Austin, but he soon learned that young Gamp Gampy, as Burr called his namesake, had died. In late December of 1812, the grief-stricken Theo set out from her home in Georgetown, South Carolina, to visit her father in New York and was never seen again. The schooner that carried Theodosia Burr Alston and her escort probably sank in a storm off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, but the mysterious circumstances of her disappearance and the controversy and mystery that always dogged Burr's career spawned legends that the unfortunate Mrs. Alston had been forced to walk the plank by pirates of mutineers or was still alive as a prisoner in the West Indies. Although devastated by his daughter's death, Aaron Burr continued to practice law and to supervise the education of his young wards. Snubbed by many of his former acquaintances and wholly removed from the game of politics that had once been his joy and delight, Aaron Burr followed the independence movements that were changing the face of Latin America with a lively but cautious interest. In 1829, he petitioned the government for a pension based on his military service during the revolution, a crusade that continued until his plea was finally granted in 1834. He became progressively more eccentric and impoverished, impoverished as the years passed. In 1831, William Seward found him living in a dirty garret, shabbily dressed, but optimistic as ever. In 1833, Aaron Burr married for a second time. His new bride was a wealthy widow with a past almost as controversial as his own. Soon became disenchanted with her husband when she discovered that he had mismanaged her assets, and she divorced him the following year. Incapacitated by a series of strokes in 1834, Aaron Burr lived on the charity of friends and relatives until his death at Port Richmond, Staten Island on September 14th of 1836. During his final hours, a clergyman inquired about his prospects for salvation. Evasive and cryptic to the end, Aaron Burr only replied, On that subject, I am coy. Aaron Burr was buried with military honors at Princeton, New Jersey on September 16th of 1836. Just some side things I wanted to read here. Uh, despite financial setbacks, after returning, Burr lived out the remainder of his life in New York in relative peace till 1833. That's returning from uh, England, of course, and Europe. On July 1st of 1833, at the age of 77, Aaron Burr married Eliza Jumel, a wealthy widow who was 19 years younger. They lived together briefly at her residence, which she had acquired with her first husband, the Morris Jamel Mansion in the Washington Heights neighborhood in Manhattan. Listed on the National Reg uh, Register of Historic Places, it is now preserved and open to the public. Soon after the marriage, she realized her fortune was dwindling due to Burr's land speculation losses. She separated from Burr after four months of marriage. For her divorce lawyer, she chose Alexander Hamilton Jr., and the divorce was officially completed on September 14th of 1836, coincidentally the day of Burr's death. Aaron Burr suffered a debilitating stroke in 1834, which rendered him immobile. And on September 14th of 1836, Burr died in Staten Island in the village of Port Richmond in a boarding house that later became known as the St. James Hotel. He was buried near his father in Princeton, New Jersey. Now some uh, quick fun facts about Burr um, here. 
Uh, Aaron Burr, um, he had a lot of children. Aaron Burr had four biological children, two stepsons, two adopted sons, and several protégés, and rumors suggest he also fathered several illegitimate children. One of those illegitimate children was said to be Martin Van Buren, the eighth president of the United States. This rumor, which has no basis, was recorded by John Quincy Adams in his personal journal. Rumors of other illegitimate children have more basis. Several families claim to be descendants of Burr's. During his first marriage, a woman of Indian or Haitian descent was employed by the Burr's as a governess. He is said to have fathered two children by that woman. One of Burr's protégés was the daughter of a French marquis who was sent to the U.S. for safekeeping during the French Revolution. The other was famed painter John Vanderlyn. Burr supported him financially for over two decades and paid for him to attend art school in Paris. And rumors of other illegitimate children have more basis. Uh, President Thomas Jefferson had him tried for treason. After Burr delivered his farewell address to the Senate in 1805, he was replaced by George Clinton. He left Washington and headed east. At the time, this was considered a suspicious move, with many assuming Burr was planning to conduct hostile takeovers and create an independent state. President Jefferson was one of those people. And in 1806, the president ordered the arrest of his former vice president, who was charged with treason and taken to Virginia for trial. The Supreme Court justice who presided over the case said there was not sufficient evidence to convict an acquitted Burr. Once the trial was over, Burr went into self exile in Europe for the next four years, which is an interesting fact about Burr. He was indicted for murder twice for that duel. Not only did the duel make Burr a social outcast, the legal fallout was devastating to his financial and political standing as well. A New York coroner's jury indicted him for murder in August, and in the following October, a New Jersey court followed suit. Writing to his daughter, Theodosia, Burr explained... There is a contention of a singular nature between the two states of New York and New Jersey. The subject in dispute is which shall have the honor of hanging the vice president. You shall have due notice of time and place. Both charges were dropped thanks to the few political friends Burr had left in the U.S. Senate. Uh, what else? Some more cool fun facts about Burr. Aaron Burr helped Tennessee join the Union. Back in 1796, Tennessee was still an independent federal territory. Its governor, William Blount, drafted and presented a constitution to the U.S. Congress. There was friction between the House and the Senate, and a bipartisan Senate committee was put in place to address the issue and come to a resolution. Aaron Burr was appointed as manager of the committee. He used his considerable influence at the time to ensure the committee ruled in favor of Tennessee joining the Union. An excellent fact about Aaron Burr, Tennessee officially became the 16th state of the Union in June of 1796. Aaron Burr liked to drink, uh, liked to drink and a cigar. Aaron Burr's law clerk, John Greenwood, recalled that Burr often ordered custom cigars and liked to pair the best ones with fine wines. He enjoyed wine with his cigars over the tipple of the time, brandy. Burr actually once stopped a duel between Alexander Hamilton and James Monroe. The story goes something like this. James Monroe called Hamilton out for giving government money to a man in prison for forgery. Hamilton explained that he, he had an affair with the imprisoned man's wife and that the funds were a blackmail payment. A few years later, Hamilton's affair was revealed publicly, driving him to accuse Monroe of leaking the dirty secret as revenge. After months of bickering, the two agreed to a duel, with Monroe choosing Burr to negotiate the terms. Instead, Aaron Burr used his considerable, considerable diplomacy skills to talk both men out of the shoot-off. And seven years later, Aaron Burr would shoot Hamilton himself. Uh, Aaron Burr founded J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. In the late 1700s, most established New York banks refused to lend money to Democratic Republicans. Aaron Burr, one of the most well-known Democratic Republicans, desperately needed a way to round the issue. He created the Manhattan Company under the guise of providing clean water. 
and then used a loophole in company legislation to turn it into a bank. Today, banking giant J.P. Morgan Chase & Company owns and displays the pistols used in the Burr-Hamilton duel. That Burr founded J.P. Morgan is not a well-known fact about Aaron Burr. He served under Benedict Arnold. Yes, the other notorious character in American history, Colonel Arnold led, led 1,100 soldiers, including Burr, from Massachusetts to Quebec in 1775. He grossly underestimated the length of the journey and lost almost half his unit on the journey. Some deserted, some died, and many were captured by the enemy during their trek. Aaron Burr was a smart kid. He applied to Princeton University for the very first time at just 11 years old. He was rejected, but applied again a couple years later. This time he's, he was accepted. And at just 13 years old, he graduated at 16. An interesting fact about Burr. Burr and his sister were orphaned young and raised by their uncle in Massachusetts and then in New Jersey. Aaron Burr believed in equality between men and women. Aaron Burr and his first wife hung a portrait of famed women's rights writer Mary Wollstonecraft above their fireplace. They shared a love of promoting equal rights for both genders and they were motivated to provide their daughter with the kind of high-quality education that was reserved for males. You know, Burr died in September of 1836 in Staten Island, uh, and throughout his 80 years, Aaron Burr was a charismatic man who had many friends, and he also had many enemies. His lack of remorse over the death of Alexander Hamilton is well-documented, and he continues to be one of the most controversial political figures in U.S. history. And that is true. Very polarizing figure. Um, so I'm going to read you some more fun facts. Um, I know this is getting long. Uh, you're probably looking at close to a two-hour video or an hour and 45-minute video here. Um, you know, I don't know if they're all going to be this long, guys, you know, vice presidents. There's a lot with Aaron Burr because he was so polarizing. Um, maybe I will make two videos moving forward. What do you guys think? Should I just break it up into two parts? Especially if I'm going to read almost verbatim from the Senate.gov website. Should I make two parts for each vice president? You know, should I do part one and part two? Um, you let me know. Let me know in the comments below what I should do. All right, so more fun facts. Aaron Burr graduated from Princeton at age 16. Uh, Burr was left an orphan at the age of two. Uh, he went to live with his uncle there, obviously in Massachusetts and then in New Jersey. He was an intelligent and precocious boy. Burr submitted an application to Princeton when he was just 11. An examiner barred his admission, but that didn't stop Burr from reapplying two years later. This time, Burr, when it was now 13, was accepted into the university, which his late father had presided over. And four years younger than most of his classmates, he earned the affectionate nickname Little Burr, a reference to both the teen's age and his short stature. He graduated with distinction in 1772 at only 16 years of age. We know that during the Revolution, he served under Benedict Arnold for a time. Um, interestingly enough, near the end of the Northward Trudge, Burr was sent to deliver a message to General Richard Montgomery, who, having taken Montreal, was also on his way to Quebec City with his own force of 300 men. Montgomery took an instant liking to Burr and recruited him as his personal aide to camp. But their partnership would soon be cut short. And on December 31st, in the midst of a snowy winter's battle, the general was killed by a cannon blast on the outskirts of the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some eyewitnesses later reported that Burr tried in vain to retrieve his commander's body from the battlefield, but historians have their doubts about this story. Uh, but yeah, he was under Colonel Benedict Arnold. Um, he was leading Patriot shoulders from Massachusetts to Quebec City by the way of Maine. Uh, so interestingly enough with Burr in uh, that. Uh, of course, we know Burr willingly left George Washington's military staff. We know that. Uh, he admired Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, he, he did. He, unlike most of his contemporaries, Burr had feminist leanings. Uh, pretty interestingly enough, um, 
She was actually the mother of the Frankenstein author Mary Shelley. Wollstonecraft's best-known writing is by far her 1792 manifesto, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, so, yeah, he was a big fan of hers. Uh, he founded J.P. Morgan and Chase. We know that. Um, he, Tennessee, we know that. He kept Alexander Hamilton out of a duel. We know that. He loved cigars. Uh, in Fallen Founder, The Life of Aaron Burr, historian Nancy Eisenberg writes that John Greenwood, who served as Burr's law clerk from 1814 to 1820, knew Burr as a constant cigar smoker. For instance, he had extra long cigars made especially for him. Often, the law clerk would find his boss cloaked in a haze of tobacco smoke. During Burr's travels in Europe, he'd sometimes burn through as many as six cigars a day. He also discovered that the choicer ones paired well with Rancio wines. Um, he's one of the most important figures in the history of Tammany Hall. To quote Gore Vidal, Aaron Burr professionalized politics in the United States. Just look at Tammany Hall. Founded in 1788, this organization started out as the Society of St. Tammany a non-political New York City social club that appealed to immigrant and working families. But by the mid-19th century, it had been transformed into Gotham's strongest political faction. And it was Burr who triggered the change. During the election of 1800, Aaron Burr made it his mission to win New York's 12 electoral votes for the Democratic-Republican Party. To help him do so, he enlisted the Society of St. Tammany, Though Burr never belonged to the club, he easy, easily capitalized on the anti-federalist sentiments of its immigrant members, who loathed the party of John Adams and his Alien and Sedition Acts. Under Burr's leadership, Tammany volunteers campaigned door-to-door -door and raised money from local donors. All their hard work paid off in dividends when Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr carried New York en route to winning the White House. Uh, we know that he was indicted in two states for murder, New York and New Jersey. He was famously, Aaron Burr was famously tried for and acquitted of treason. We know that. Uh, yeah, we know Burr's second wife left him. She hired Alexander Hamilton Jr. as her divorce attorney. Uh, crazy. Martin Van Buren was rumored to be Burr's illegitimate son. So crazy. For they, sh they shared a, a knack for growing sideburns, but no genes. Old Kinderhook, as Van Buren was sometimes known, first met Burr in 1803. The two became reacquainted after Jefferson's former vice president came back from his self-imposed European exile and resumed his New York law practice. Together, they ended up collaborating on a handful of legal cases. This gave rise to the absurd rumor, as recorded by John Quincy Adams in his diary, that Martin Van Buren was Burr's bastard child. Crazy. And last but not least, a work of Aaron Burr erotica was anonymously published in 1861. No, really, this exists. Burr's enemies, including Hamilton, were known to accuse him of, accuse him of rampant womanizing. Such rumors help explain what is quite possibly the strangest work in American literature. 1861's The Amorous Intrigues and Adventures of Aaron Burr. Presented as a novelized biography, the book, whose author is unknown, retells everything from Burr's birth in 1756 to his death 80 years later. But it also includes lurid descriptions of fictitious sexual conquests in several different states, with virgins, young widows, and unhappy wives constantly throwing themselves at our protagonist. For those who might be looking for a less racy novel about Jefferson's first vice president, there is Gore Vidal's 1973 bestseller, Burr. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Well, there you go, guys. There's Aaron Burr, our third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, and our first vice presidential series, uh, subject. So I hope you enjoyed this. The very first vice presidential series installment. Taking a look at Aaron Burr. Uh, there is bonus footage, so stay tuned for that. 
some wonderful bonus footage, I think. So stay tuned. And I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I know it's a little different. Not as many portraits or photos that I can show. Kind of leaving the same photo or portrait up for sometimes 10, 15 minutes at a clip. But that's unfortunately the way this goes because we just don't have as many with vice presidents. So hope you enjoyed the information. Uh, like I said, I know this was a long video, almost two hours or so. I apologize for the length, but it was necessary. And maybe do we do these in two parts? You tell me in the comments below. If you feel, I, and listen, not every one of these is going to be this long. I would say most of them will be an hour to an hour and 15 minutes long if I had to guess for each vice president. But do we do it in two parts? You know, part one, like 40, 45 minutes long, and part two, another, you know, 30 to 40 minutes long? Is that how we do this? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much, guys, for all the support. Thank you for sticking by us all this time. I'm so excited about this vice presidential series. I mean that sincerely. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I really do. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I really would love to know. And stay tuned for next week's installment of this vice presidential series as we're going to take a look at the fourth vice president of the United States, George Clinton. Stay tuned. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, of course. And this is our bonus footage for our third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr. And I'm going to do this bonus footage the same way that I did the George Washington bonus video that I put out. I'm going to basically narrate uh, via audio like this. Uh, exactly what you're going to be seeing on the next slideshow screens. So basically, it's a little audio introduction to what uh, you're going to be actually seeing on your screen. So I'm going to jump right in here for you. Uh, the first thing that you're actually going to see is the Presbyterian Church of Newark, New Jersey, uh, also known as the First Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, it's in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, this was actually built in 1666. Yes, crazy. Long time ago. And on December 21st of 1736, Aaron Burr Sr. became a minister of the Presbyterian Church of Newark, New Jersey. Um, so yes, Aaron Burr's father, Aaron Burr Sr., he became a minister right here at the Presbyterian Church of Newark, New Jersey. So uh, this is where that was. Uh, also, not far from here, there is no marker and there is no building or structure still standing, of course. But not far from this location is where Aaron Burr, our third vice president, was born. Aaron Burr was born in Newark, New Jersey. So um, not far from here. So here you go. The first Presbyterian Church of Newark, New Jersey, where Aaron Burr Sr., Aaron Burr's father, was a minister. Take a look. Hey guys, TJ here. Sorry for the noise. Just behind me, I'll show you. I'll flip you guys around. So this is the First Presbyterian Church in Newark, New Jersey. Got some uh, music going on here. The Old First. First Presbyterian Church organized in 1666. The reason I'm showing you guys this is because this is actually where... Aaron Burr Sr. was a minister. So Aaron Burr's father. It's this building right here. This one's kind of the newer one. Still a beautiful church, but there you go. So Aaron Burr Sr., Aaron Burr's father, was a minister here in Newark, New Jersey. And also, um, not very far from here, Aaron Burr was born. Uh, there's no marker or any building or anything like that where Aaron Burr was born, still left or standing, but there you go. The first Presbyterian church where Aaron Burr Sr. was a minister. And not far from where Aaron Burr was born here in Newark, New Jersey. Thanks guys.
From there, we're going to take a look at a house that Aaron Burr lived at in New York City. Uh, it was actually at the, the exact address is 17 Commerce Street in New York City. Uh, it's down in the village. There used to be a plaque that right outside the house that said the Aaron Burr House, 1802. Unfortunately, that plaque is no longer there. However, at 17 Commerce Street in New York City, which is the village uh, downtown uh, in New York City, um, nice area. It's actually the West Village. Um, beautiful area. So this is a house that Aaron Burr owned uh, and lived at. 1802 is the date or was the date on it. The plaque is no longer there, but this is where it was. So take a look. 17 Commerce Street in New York City, one of Aaron Burr's homes. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. And I am actually on Commerce Street. Uh, in the village. This is the village of New York City. I'm gonna flip you guys around. So here's Commerce Street and at 17 Commerce Street was actually the home of Aaron Burr or one of the homes I should say. Uh, there used to be a plaque and it's actually that building right there. Um, there used to be a plaque but I don't believe there is anymore. But this was the home right here at 17 Commerce Street of Aaron Burr. And yeah, it looks like the plaque is no longer here, but this was it right here. 17 Commerce Street in the village in New York City, Aaron Burr House. Thanks, guys. And from Commerce Street, we go right around the corner uh, to where Richmond Hill was located. Richmond Hill was a colonial estate in Manhattan. Um, it was basically part of, uh, there were several people that actually owned it. Uh, it stood on the southeast, it stood southeast basically of the modern intersection of Varick and Charlton Streets. Uh, it's right in Greenwich Village. Um, I'm actually going to show you a picture real quick on your screen of a sketch of what the Richmond Hill mansion looked like. However, Aaron Burr lived here at Richmond Hill. Uh, in 1794, as a matter of fact, it was purchased as a country home by Aaron Burr. Um, so yeah, so Aaron Burr pu purchased this uh, in 1794. Um, and on the morning of July 11th of 1804, Aaron Burr arose from Richmond Hill and basically had himself ferried across the Hudson River to have that famous duel with Alexander Hamilton. So, yes, right around this location, uh, I don't know the exact corner or the exact spot, but I am literally within probably 20 yards of where it was uh, for these next pictures you're going to see. This is where Richmond Hill Mansion stood, where Aaron Burr lived, and where he left from that morning to go duel with Alexander Hamilton. Take a look. So another thing I wanted to mention real quick was J.P. Morgan Chase, as we learned, Aaron Burr founded J.P. Morgan Chase, technically. The J.P. Morgan Chase headquarters in New York City uh, supposedly owns the, actually, the actual dueling guns from Hamilton and Burr from the famous duel. Yes, the actual pistols, they own them. And they used to be on display at the J.P. Morgan Chase headquarters in New York City. I went there today, however, I could not find them anywhere in the lobby. Uh, it is a very heavily security guarded building, uh, so I was only able to basically see the main lobby. There was nothing on display there. I know 
that J.P. Morgan Chase owned them, and then they had lent them out for museums to borrow them, to put them on display at different museums throughout the country. I think they were down in Washington, D.C. at a museum for a while. So I don't know if currently they're on borrow by some museum throughout the country. I'm not sure. I'd have to do further research on that. Or you could do further research on it if you Googled Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton dueling pistols. Uh, you might be able to find out where they are located right now. But I went to J.P. Morgan Chase and could not find them. I do apologize for that. But what you're going to see next is that's actually the Morris Jumel Mansion. Uh, this is actually in the Bronx, New York. Uh, and this is where uh, Aaron Burr's second wife actually lived. Uh, so Eliza Bowen Jumel, she was Aaron Burr's second wife. Uh, she was w once married before uh, in her first marriage, and then she was divorced, and then she married Aaron Burr, or I don't know if she was divorced or maybe her husband died. I, I don't really know that uh, story off the top of my head, but point is that Aaron Burr married her uh, at this mansion. So this is where Aaron Burr's second wife, Eliza Jumel, and Aaron Burr both were married in the parlor of this mansion. And they lived here for a very short period of time. Their marriage did not, uh, it did not uh, last long. It was a very, very, very short-lived marriage. Uh, but here it is. Uh, it's called the Morris Jumel Mansion in New York City. Pretty little interesting side note. The mansion actually overlooks uh, Coogan's Hollow, uh, or better known as Coogan's Bluff, and the Polo Grounds, where the uh, the baseball and football stadium was, uh, where the New York Giants uh, used to play. Uh, the New York Giants of baseball, that is, at the Polo Grounds. So this overlooks right where that is. So just to give you an idea of where it's at. So here you go. Uh, the uh, mansion where Aaron Burr and his second wife were married in New York City. Hey guys, TJ with Dead History here. And this right here, I'll flip you guys around. I'm actually in the Bronx, New York. And this building right here is actually the Morris Jumel uh, Mansion. Uh, this is the mansion that Eliza Jumel lived in with Aaron Burr. Um, this was actually, uh, they were married in the front parlor of this home, actually. The front parlor. I believe it was the front parlor, actually. So, hold on. I'm going to pause it and show you guys the front. So, there you go. This is the Eliza Jumel mansion, and this is where, in that front parlor somewhere, is where Eliza Jumel and Aaron Burr got married, actually. So, and Aaron Burr did live here uh, for a very short time, but with Eliza Jumel. So, the Eliza Jumel mansion here in the Bronx, New York. Thanks, guys. And from New York, then we take a look at the Hermitage in Hohokus, New Jersey. Uh, located in Hohokus, which is in Bergen County, New Jersey, is the Hermitage. The Hermitage was actually owned, uh, it was a home of Aaron Burr's first wife. Yes, uh, and Aaron Burr's first wife, Theodosia, her and Aaron Burr were actually married in this home. Yes. So his first marriage, Theodosia and him were married here at this home in the Hermitage. And there was a building, I don't think it stands anymore, on this property that Aaron Burr and Theodosia, his first wife, actually lived at for a time. Uh, and yes, yeah, so not only did we see where he was married to his second wife, 
now you're taking a look at mar where he married his first wife. So, yes, both uh, weddings of Aaron Burr's. We saw the locations. So here you go. The Hermitage in Hohokus, New Jersey, where Aaron Burr's first wife and him, Theodosia, were married and where they lived for a time. Take a look. Hey, guys. TJ here with Dead History. And that right there, I'm going to turn you guys around. So take a look at this sign over here. I am in Hohokus, New Jersey. Hohokus. Yes, H O H O K U S. Hohokus. And I am at the Hermitage. As you see, and that is the Hermitage House. So the Hermitage House is where Theodosia uh, lived uh, with her first husband. And Theodosia is the first wife of Aaron Burr. And they actually lived here for a short time, Theodosia and Aaron Burr. And, I was just telling you about the well here. Um, they actually got married inside this house. So we have now seen where Aaron Burr was married to his second wife. And now to his first wife. So, uh, pretty interesting stuff. The locations of both of Aaron Burr's weddings. Um, but this is the Hermitage here in Hohokus, New Jersey. So, pretty cool stuff. I don't think... It might be open, but I don't think it is. Uh, well, here you go. Here's the main house. It'd be pretty cool if we could actually go inside, but highly doubt it's open. What's this sign say? Front house. Okay, there you go. Not open. All right, well, there you go, guys. There's the Hermitage here in Hohokus, New Jersey, where Aaron Burr lived with his first wife and where he was married uh, the very first time. So, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, that's pretty much it. There you go, Aaron Burr, another Aaron Burr location. And now, of course, we take a look at the Weehawken Dueling Grounds in Weehawken, New Jersey. So this is where the infamous, very famous duel between Alexander Hamilton and the third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, took place. Uh, it was right under the cliffs of Weehawken, New Jersey. Uh, in New York State, dueling was illegal. However, in New Jersey, it was still legal at the time. So, as the play Hamilton, uh, the musical Hamilton, there's a famous line in that musical that says, everything is legal in New Jersey. So, what did Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr do? They ferried across the Hudson River into New Jersey, and they dueled right underneath the cliffs at Weehawken, New Jersey, the dueling grounds. And this is where Aaron Burr shot and fatally wounded and ended up killing Alexander Hamilton. You will see here, supposedly the boulder, the rock, that Alexander Hamilton fell upon after he was shot by Burr and was bleeding out onto. So that is the, the story, and that's the way it goes, that this rock and this boulder that you're going to see is the actual boulder that Hamilton fell down upon after that famous duel. It is in Weehawken, New Jersey, right there, right across the Hudson River. You can take a rock and hit the New York City skyline, as you will see in the video and the pictures. But here you go, the location of the famous duel in Weehawken, New Jersey, between Alexander Hamilton and our third vice president, Aaron Burr. Take a look. Hey, guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And, uh, yeah, behind me, that is Manhattan. That is New York City. 
Uh, why the heck am I here showing you a view of New York City? Well, let me flip you around and show you where I'm at. I am actually at the dueling ground where Aaron Burr so famously killed Alexander Hamilton. Uh, this was actually the dueling ground right here. As you can read from uh, this plaque here, uh, the most famous duel in American history took place on this date at the dueling grounds in Weehawken, New Jersey, between political rivals General Alexander Hamilton and sitting Vice President of the United States, Colonel Aaron Burr. Hamilton fell mortally wounded and died the next day in New York City. And tragically, Hamilton's son, Philip, had also met his death here in a duel in 1801. Uh, so this is the spot and the location. Here is a, uh, a statue of Alexander Hamilton. It's supposedly, as the tale in the story goes, um, as you see, there's Hamilton there. Uh, this rock, supposedly, is the actual death rock of Alexander Hamilton. Now, that is the fable. I don't know really how true it is. But, supposedly, what happened was they obviously came across the Hudson from New York City because dueling was illegal in New York and it was legal here in New Jersey. Of course, everybody knows that famous line from the play Hamilton, everything's legal in New Jersey. You know, they had the duel right below us, on uh, below these cliffs here in Weehawken. And Burr shot him, and Hamilton apparently fell onto this rock and uh, was bleeding out before he was ferried back across to New York City uh, where he later died. So supposedly this is the actual rock that Hamilton uh, fell onto and died, but I don't know how true that really is. Um, but there you go. It's the uh, dueling grounds where sitting vice president, could you imagine a vice president murdered another human being? Uh, Aaron Burr killed Alexander Hamilton here in Weehawken, New Jersey. So thanks, guys. And from the dueling grounds, we take a look a little further down the road, only about a mile, and we go to Lincoln Harbor. Lincoln Harbor is right there in Weehawken, New Jersey as well, uh, literally right next to the Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, you could literally, again, throw a rock and hit the Lincoln Tunnel entrance from where Lincoln Harbor is. Uh, and we take a look at a really cool statue of that duel between Alexander Hamilton and third vice president Aaron Burr. So here's a really awesome statue at the Lincoln Harbor in Weehawken, New Jersey of the famous duel between the two. Take a look. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History and behind me it's uh, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr statues. Let me uh, flip you around. So I am at uh, Lincoln Harbor and See here where it says, and there's the statue of Aaron Burr with his pistol, and there's the statue of Alexander Hamilton with his pistol. So we haul things right around the corner. If you actually look, take a look at this. When I turn around, there's Manhattan. <laughs> that is the New York City skyline over there. And here's the statues. So pretty cool stuff. This is right here in Weehawken, New Jersey, so thanks guys.
And now we take a look in Staten Island, New York, in the Port Richmond section of Staten, Staten Island, New York, where uh, what once became the St. James Hotel, uh, this is actually the location and the exact site where Aaron Burr died. Uh, unfortunately, Aaron Burr died a very uh, poor and kind of sad, lonely man, um, and he he died here, uh, but literally by himself. Um, so yeah, so uh, this this is where it was. Um, so so there you have it. I mean, this is the where, where the St. James Hotel was. I believe at the time it was actually a boarding house, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and at the time when uh, he actually died here. Um, but yeah, so the site where Aaron Burr spent the last, he spent his last year of his life here. Uh, it's at, at Port Richmond Avenue and Richmond Terrace. Um, it, it was like a boarding house when he was there for the last year of his life. And then I believe it was after that it became uh, the St. James Hotel. Uh, actually, the picture you're seeing here on your screen, that's of the uh, when it was the St. James Hotel there in Port Richmond. This is out on Staten Island in New York, but this is the location and site where our third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, died. Take a look. Hey guys, TJ with Dead History. And that behind me is actually what once was the St. James Hotel. Uh, let me flip you guys around. So I'm actually here in Staten Island. This is actually in Port Richmond in Staten Island, New York. And that building right there that has been recently renovated, that actually uh, was where the St. James Hotel was. That is actually where, that building, where Aaron Burr died. Uh, he did die in this building. Uh, I believe it was in 1836, I wanna say, uh, was the date, um, or the year, I should say. Uh, he was old, he was crippled, he was bankrupt uh, when he died. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he, he died a very, very unpopular person, too, at the time, of course, after killing Alexander Hamilton and then fleeing and, and all that stuff. So uh, there used to be a plaque. So I came here last year. You're going to see pictures I'm going to show you of that. Uh, I came here last year, and there used to be... Um, an actual like plaque near the door. The plaque is no longer there. I don't know if they're, that said this is where Aaron Burr died. I don't know if they're gonna replace it or not, but this is the location where the St. James Hotel was, where Vice President Aaron Burr died back in, I believe it was 1836. Thanks guys. And last but certainly not least, now we take a look in Princeton Cemetery. In Princeton Cemetery, you're going to see, of course, the burial site, the grave site of our third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr. Buried here in Princeton, New Jersey, in the Princeton Cemetery, only about maybe 40 to 50 yards from our 22nd and 24th president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. So yes, and pretty much right next to John Witherspoon, a Declaration of Independence signer. They're all right here in the Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey. So this is the gravesite of Aaron Burr. And I'm also going to show you in this next footage, not only the gravesite of Aaron Burr, but also the gravesite of his father, who's buried right behind him, Aaron Burr Sr. And then his grandfather, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who's buried right there uh, beside, um, uh, next to him, and basically right behind him as well. So you're going to see Aaron Burr's gravesite, his father Aaron Burr Sr.'s gravesite, then you're going to see his 
maternal grandfather, Jonathan Edwards' gravesite, and his maternal grandmother, Sarah Pierpont Edwards' gravesite. You're going to see them all. So basically, his maternal grandmother and grandfather, his father, and himself, Aaron Burr, here at Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey, the final resting place of our third Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy looking at the gravesite there uh, after I'm done talking here. Uh, Aaron Burr, there you go, guys. Stay tuned for next week as we take a look at the next, the fourth Vice President, George Clinton. It's going to be a lot of fun, and Henry will be back to make that video with me. So stay tuned. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for all the support. You guys are the best. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. Hey, guys. TJ back with you around. So you can kind of see behind me. Whoop, where am I at? Boop, boop, boop. Right back there. Right back there. Huh? Like right there is Grover Cleveland's grave. Okay? That's how close I am to where I'm taking you now to Aaron Burr and John Witherspoon. So, I mean, like I told you, 50 yards? I don't even know if it is 50 yards, to be completely honest. So right here is the gravesite of Vice President Aaron Burr, who obviously was famous for not only being Vice President, but also involved in that very, very famous duel between himself and Alexander Hamilton, where he shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. He was Thomas Jefferson's uh, Vice President. So there you go, the gravesite of Vice President and famous dueler Aaron Burr. And again, if you can look in conjunction, here's Burr's. And like Cleveland's like right back over there. I mean, it's really pretty close. Like right back a little past that other one there. Not far at all. And then look, if you look here, here's Burr. And right here next to Burr is John Witherspoon. Declaration of Independence signer John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon, of course, was um, one of the Declaration of Independence signers. He was also, uh, I believe, yes, he was. He was uh, one of the presidents of Princeton College. So right here is John Witherspoon's gravesite as well. So there you go. You got John Witherspoon here and Aaron Burr there and Grover Cleveland back there. That is how... Hey, guys, TJ here. And uh, actually, I'm still here at the Princeton Cemetery because... Is it this one? This one right behind me. Let me turn you around. So... You have Aaron Burr right here, and right behind him here is his father, Aaron Burr Sr. So this is Aaron Burr's father, Aaron Burr Sr., buried right here uh, in the uh, Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey. And right next to him, right here, is actually Aaron Burr's grandfather, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, this is actually his maternal grandfather. This was Aaron Burr's mother's father, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, you guys heard about him in, uh, in the video. I talked a little bit about uh, Jonathan Edwards and his relationship with, uh, of course, Aaron Burr. Uh, so there you go. Let me take a little uh, backup view here. So you have Aaron Burr here. You have his father, Aaron Burr Sr., behind him to the right. And then behind him to the left, his maternal grandfather Jonathan Edwards all here at the Princeton Cemetery in Princeton New Jersey thanks guys so in the world of grave hunting sometimes things don't always pan out the way that you think you see behind me that's the back side of Aaron Burr's grave and that's actually right in front of me there or behind me I should say is Jonathan Edwards his maternal grandfather now the interesting thing I'm gonna flip you guys around is you see there, so there's Aaron Burr's father, Aaron Burr Sr. There's Aaron Burr there. And this is Jonathan Edwards, his maternal grandfather. And then it says here, in memory of Sarah, wife of the Reverend Jonathan Edwards. Now, I get, I am assuming she is entombed here with him, with Jonathan as well. Which, that is Aaron Burr's grandmother. So, um, obviously. Uh, this was his maternal grandfather, and this would be his maternal grandmother. However, there's pictures that I'm finding on Find a Grave and such 
that show a fairly tall obelisk or obelisk um, kind of a family plot of the Edwards uh, with Sarah there, the wife of Jonathan Edwards with some children of theirs and I can't find that anywhere. Uh, I've been searching around for a few minutes and I can't find it but I did come across the backside of Jonathan's grave and see this memorial to Sarah here, you know, this uh, epitaph here. So I assume that Sarah, Aaron Burr's maternal grandmother, is right here also, but I am not 100% sure. That would be my assumption, though. So there you go, guys. Thanks. Hey, guys, how's it going? Uh, so here you go. The gravesite of Aaron Burr right behind me. Let me flip you around. So there it is, the gravesite of our third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, uh, buried here at the Princeton Cemetery in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, I will show you there's a couple graves right behind him of significance, actually. Uh, I'll show you that in a second here. Uh, and right over, so you see Aaron Burr's, uh, right over, right around there, right, right behind there is actually uh, Grover Cleveland's gravesite. So... Uh, President Grover Cleveland is very close to uh, Aaron Burr. So, Aaron Burr's gravesite here in Princeton, New Jersey. Thanks, guys.